So I'm standing here today in front of you in great humility and with a sore throat. I can only tell you a story. I was born and raised in Greece, went to London to study engineering and stayed to work in the financial sector. For myself, as well as many others, London was the promised land. So there I was, after nine years in England, enjoying the life of a cosmopolitan city and running my own investment fund. Then one day, my brother Alexandros calls me up with a business idea he put together while at business school. A chain of retail stores, he says, selling excess inventory, outlet type, in electronics, baby goods, furniture, clothing. Fantastic. I'm in. Where? Well, in Guatemala. <laughs> Guatemala? Seriously? The only time I had heard the country even being mentioned was on the news during the 1980s, while it was at civil war. It cost the lives of 200,000 people. So I went over, got the atlas, opened up, and saw that today Guatemala is the biggest economy in Central America, just south of Mexico. Size, similar to Greece. Population, 60% indigenous people. 40% illiteracy rate. And consequently, a very high crime rate. Average, 25 murders a week. But I was not to worry, because the project did not need our physical presence there. Right. A few months later, our local partner calls us up, asking for some help to set up the operations. I thought I could go for a month, visit exotic Guatemala, climb a volcano, swim in the lakes in the 1500 meters, enjoy the jungle and the ruins of the Mayan civilization, set up the company, and be back in London to work on my fund. That month was supposed to be October 2001, the longest month of my life. <laughs> Ten years later, it's still going strong. A few months later, we were faced with a dilemma. To buy or not the, the partner's share and run the company ourselves. We knew it would not be easy. We were in Central America, in a country developing, having no connections. My use of Spanish was minimal. The people we worked with did not speak English. And there was no plan B to fall back to. But it felt right. There was something inside us urging us to take that leap of faith. Our parents were astonished. Are you guys nuts? Are you crazy? What's wrong with you? You have great education and guaranteed work in the developed world. Why Guatemala? But they believed in us. They trusted us and supported our decision. Although, as you know, it's very difficult for a parent to have both their kids so far away. Could we have waited longer to take the decision? Yes. We could have weighed the pros and cons and, be, and wait until all the stars are aligned before we decided. Would it have been a different decision? Maybe. Would it have been a better decision? Definitely not. Were we afraid of failure? Naturally, yes, but we ignored it. So we took that leap of faith, hence breaking our own boundaries, getting way out of our comfort zone. We took it with a big smile on our faces, and we crashed. <laughs> More than once. Our providers did not deliver the product we had purchased. The port authorities in Guatemala, well, they charged us ridiculous taxes, unless we would contribute to the family's prosperity. When Alexandros and I took vacation at the same time, a practice we had avoided for a long while, then two of our stores, the bigger ones, were stripped clean. Suddenly, we were faced with a great unknown. We were alone and scared. Did we give up? 
pack our things, accept defeat, and leave. No. Instead, we try to change the perspective and see the problem in front of us as a challenge. With that in mind, we changed providers. We sought people that had a similar vision to ours, who could give us credit, since we had no product and no funds, in a zero-credit business. In the port, we fought corruption with legal arguments and the transparency of our transactions. Guatemalan lawyers did not know how to form a case. Nobody fought the port authorities. So we studied the laws ourselves, although we had a limited knowledge of the legal system and the language, and we armed our defense. We had 52 cases outstanding. We won every single one of them. Finally, the port authorities gave up. <laughs> and they never adjusted the duties on the next 150 containers we brought in the country. We had found what made us tick. If we were afraid of failure, we would have never gone there. So the fruits of our results were visible. Two Greeks create the company, giving work to 70 families in Guatemala. We got a house in the old city of Antigua, Guatemala, which is protected by UNESCO, and remodeled it into a cultural and commercial center of colonial splendor. We started the telecoms business, and from an office of five, it grew into a multinational company with leading presence across Latin America. That was the result of a conscious effort and the attitude inspired by Winston Churchill of never, ever, ever, ever giving up. If we were afraid, we would not have tried. We knew that you learn from trial and error. Babies, when they learn to walk, they fall and fall again. Loving parents, don't say, it's okay, son, this is not for you. <laughs> we'll find something you're really good at. How about crawling? Yes, we'll stick to that. Crawling is for you. No. Instead, they urge us to get up and try and try and learn from the failure and try again. And guess what? We all got it right. <laughs> Business opportunity is what brought us to Guatemala. The reason we stayed and the reason we will always have Guatemala in our hearts. What, every, what made everything more meaningful was finding the courage to create opportunities for someone else. Someone who cannot give you anything material in return, and yet they give you everything, their gratitude, their love. This is the other side of this story, a most wonderful and fulfilling side to my life that helped me see the world through different eyes. It has to do with a small group of kids that adopted us two years in our lives in Guatemala. From our interaction, from a simple smile and a hello, we were drawn into the world. From the time we spent together, grew in us the desire to educate them, to give them something more. So we had an English teacher, and then we had a tutor to help them with homework. The average statistics say that the Guatemalan spends 3.5 years in school, not even fourth grade. So when we would finish our day's work, we would join the kids in their evening class, which was taking place in our meeting room, and just sit with them and read them a book, talk and tell them tales of the Greek mythology they learned to love so much. Soon, it was the brothers and the friends and the younger cousins who wanted to join our team. It was frustrating to see how many 10-year-olds could not read or write, how many second graders could not count to 20. But at the same time, there was the opportunity to give something to these kids and make not a difference, but the difference in their lives. 
as of 2007, we formed a formal foundation. These kids live in extreme conditions with a totally different concept of a family than what we have. Half of them have had one or both parents, they've lost them, either to alcoholism or to the violence that plagues Guatemala City. So what we've been trying to do from early on is educate them in the broadest sense of the word. Not just help them with their formal schooling, but teach them morals and values. These kids learn of themselves through games and interacting with each other. We cannot all be great at all things. Just as Ken Robinson said in his speech, we should go past the industrial education. We identify talent and we promote its development. Sami, she's nine years old and yet she's the fastest girl in the neighborhood. She outruns boys four years older than her. So what we did is inscribe her in the national training team. These kids have no one to tell them, you are worth a lot. I believe in you. Dream big, bigger, and I will be next to you, hugging you along, forcing you along your way to fulfill your path. This has now become our role, and we're so happy about it. I have seen these kids learn from us values during the time we interact with each other, and then they go back to their homes and they share it with their environment. Angel, a seven-year-old, was teaching the other day Daniela of nine how to read. And then ten minutes later, it was Daniela telling Angel how to do his mathematics. I was impressed to see Marielos, who is now 11, showing Elsa, who is seven, how to use a knife and fork. When I asked her, what did you learn this? She said, you taught my older brothers a few years back at a trip we took to the beach. It is so easy to make the difference in a child's life. All they need is a little bit of your time. Our foundation does not have the means or the infrastructure to make things easy. But what we do have is ourselves. Our world, our stories, our time, our courage to keep fighting in order to give these kids the opportunity. I have learned something amazing from these kids through the satisfaction of giving, and I know that the best present you can ever receive is the one you give. For us, it cannot be a numbers game. I see what other TED speakers have done in the field of poverty and education, and I am humbled. Since the beginning, we believed that if from that first group of seven, we could only change the lives of one, if one of them broke through their destiny and finished their studies, or even go to university, then we have done our work. Well, meet Chus. Hola, me llamo Fernando, pero mi familia me llama Chus. Tengo 19 años y el próximo año iré a la universidad a estudiar arquitectura y diseño. Hace 9 años conocí a Ilias y Alex. A partir de ese momento compartí y aprendí mucho con la Fundación Poblías. Ellos creyeron y confiaron mucho en mí, pues saben que me he esforzado mucho en mis estudios. Sé que tengo muchas opciones en mi vida ahora, pero pretendo seguir estudiando mucho y ser un gran ejemplo para mi familia. Quiero superar mis metas paso a paso y agradecer a la Fundación poniendo todo mi empeño para superar mi destino y mejorar mi país. He is the first one in his family and in the whole neighborhood who will be going to university. And he's not alone. Here is Chicho, who loves to dream big. Hi, my name is Luis Carlos, but my friends call me Chicho. I, I want to be an architect. This year, I am competing with the national team at long distance running. 
As of next year, I have promised to myself that I will study to enter the university. My dream is to be known as an international athlete and as a great architect. And there are another 20, the next generation, who will be changing their world and consequently ours. We believe in what we do. Because the courage needed for them to change their destiny is so much more than the courage we need to create a place where we provide the opportunity to do so. I feel there's a different type of courage needed in each of our stories. In the first case, with work, we needed a lot of courage at the beginning to set up the company against the odds in a foreign land. In the foundation, with the children, we find ourselves many times alone, fighting against the disappointments, against the current. So what we need is a small but daily dosage of courage to help us to keep fighting and creating a world of opportunity for these kids. The world can be molded one by one. I believe in the power of the unit. Start, and we will follow. So kindly, today, I will ask you, pretty please, stand up from your seats. Get up and show your passion that brought you here today. Please, and if the person next to you is not standing up, grab them by the hand and share the passion, the passion that fills this room. This is TEDx. Your passion and your courage will change this world. Ted, these are the ideas worth sharing. Thank you for your bravery. Thank you for your time.